The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we are webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. And today, it's Friday, December 20th. This is the last live show of 2013. Uh, I have mixed feelings about that. So thrilled and proud of the work that we've been able to do here this year. But uh, it's coming to an end, and we have so much more to say. Thank heavens we're back in 2014, right? Because <laughs> I don't know that we'll ever say all the things that there are to be said or have all the guests that there are to have on the show. But we'll keep trying, right? I refer to us as the little show that could. Before I get too far entrenched, I want to remind you that today is the last day of the holiday giveaway extravaganza. So we still, uh, both hours that we're live this morning, we have things to give away. And in this hour, we are going to give away another six IBT trainings. They come in sets of two, so there's a total of six of them, but they're in three different packages. So let me describe to you. First of all, these are coming from the Institute for Behavioral Training. You can visit their website at ibehavioraltraining.com and you'll see when you get there, you, there are a bunch of different things you can do on the site. And there are a bunch of different people that they take care of and help to provide different um, kinds of trainings. But click on the e-learning tab that's at the top of the page and then you will see that there are now three categories that there are professionals who are working with individuals on the spectrum who can get more training and get CEUs then there is a category that is just for teachers how many times have we all said I want to get some very specific trainings for my child's teacher or those of you who are out there who are teachers who are wanting tools I'm a former teacher so I know how important it is to be in the classroom and to be given real work world real life tools to be able to deal with kids and their very individual issues to help them access their curriculum and a lot of times in the past, the training that's been out there, uh, it's been for a parent at home in a home setting or for a practitioner in the home setting or out and about. But there's been very little that's tailored specifically to how do you make ABA techniques work and the things that are scientifically proven to be effective within the classroom when you're not having one child to deal with. Uh, you know, it's hard enough when it's one-on-one, -on -one, but how about when you have one to 31, which is sometimes the reality in this economic world that we're living in. So these trainings are specifically for teachers in that category, and we're going to talk about those in a second. But then there's a third category that is just for parents. So there's less intensive jargon, things are put very easily. All of these trainings, they're e-learnings, they're videos that you purchase for a very small fee, as low as $7.50. So this is not break the bank, right? but it will increase your skill level and your ability to be a stronger member of the team. I have always said, as a parent, I whatever it takes, I do not want to be the, work, the weakest person on my child's team. I, I don't expect to be the person who is the strongest because I want to have rock stars and superstars who really know what they're doing that I'm learning from, right? But I will not be the weakest person on the team. If you feel that way, you want to visit ibehavioraltraining.com. But they've given us some packages to give away and I specifically asked for some teacher packages because we need gifts to give teachers and we want to give them tools right um, so there are three different packages package number one skill acquisition shaping and chaining in the classroom an effective way to teach new skills this is specifically going to help a teacher to understand techniques that they want to use to teach any child that is having difficulty a new skill so this is going to work for 
for kids that are on the autism spectrum, but this is also going to work for the kids in the classroom that have other behavior issues or other learning issues. If a child's got a learning disability and we want to teach them new things, right? That's what they're supposed to be doing in the classroom. That's what good teachers do in the classroom, but sometimes we need different ways of doing it. So skill acquisition, shaping and chaining, how to build a skill really successfully. And then the second one in that package, is, this is package number one, encouraging success outside the classroom. So this one is for success during class recess and break times. How many times have we all said, okay, you know, child's doing well in the classroom, but sometimes it falls apart when it's outside. So ways that your teacher can encourage that success. Then package number two, curriculum and implementation, social skills training in the classroom. How fabulous is that? I just like the angel go, whoa. Uh, so way to tell, help your teacher to be able to access those social skills within the classroom and within the things that they're already doing. And the second one, how great is this? Behavior management. The thing that we've been talking about the last two weeks, positive behavior supports, token economies in the classroom. A lot of times teachers will say, you know, well, I can't do this intervention. Or I can't do that intervention because I've got 28 or 31 or 35 kids in this classroom. I don't have time to reward reward this child every time with something that will keep them motivated. That's when we put token economies in place so the teacher can be putting a star someplace on a piece of paper or the child can give themselves a sticker uh, or an aide can be giving a sticker that they get five stickers and it translates into something during recess. It makes it really accessible for everyone in the classroom. It's very doable. And this video teaches about exactly how to implement that. So that's package number two. Package number three, encouraging success outside the classroom, emergency preparedness. For all of us who have had that sick feeling in our stomach about what happens if something drastic happens at school, will my child be prepared? Will the teacher be prepared? Will the other people be prepared to be able to help my child because they're sound sensitive or because they're not going to follow, you know, silent hand gestures, uh, whatever it is. This is going to get your teacher prepared for emergencies. And then the second one in, in package number three is modify the classroom, school for success, environmental changes in the classroom, little things that a teacher can do to change that environment, to make it a sensory friendly place so that the child is set up for success. And by the way, all of these things, while there is a specific mind to helping children on the autism spectrum, they work for all kids that are struggling in the classroom, that need to be caught up, that are having some behavior issues. This is a wonderful gift uh, any of these packages are a wonderful gift to give to any teacher because if you've spent any time in the classroom, knowledge is power and tools, man, give the right tools to the right person and watch them fly. So I'm a big believer in giving our teachers tools. They didn't get this training. I assure you, they did not get this training when they went to school. Uh, and these are from people who have been working in the field of autism, some of them for over 20 years. Uh, the trainings are very simplistic, but powerful. So that's iBehavioral training that, that donated those, and we're going to be giving some more away in the next hour. Uh, but how you win, let's talk about this one last time. This is the last day for the holiday giveaway extravaganza. Uh, so you're watching the show. We tell you what the gift is, and then you watch throughout the hour. At some point, Emily will put on the screen a word or a phrase. It'll just pop up for a couple of seconds. Write that word or phrase down and email us at this address that Emily's going to show you. You. There it is. And uh, in the subject line, put what you want to win. So for this hour, you would put IBT trainings. And in the body of the email, you will put the word of the phrase. You need to email it to us by 7 a.m. tomorrow Pacific time. 7 a.m. Pacific time tomorrow. Of the correct responses, one winner will be chosen for each one of these packages in this hour. And we will email you and let you know uh, and try to hook you up with that. I, uh, I will not make promises.
promise is that we will hook you up with it before actual Christmas, but you will get hooked up with it. All right. Uh, so having said that, I want to remind you that this entire show is meant to be interactive. We hope that as you watch, you feel empowered to give us suggestions, to ask questions, to ask our guests for more information about whatever it is that they're talking about or things that they haven't discussed yet. I want to reiterate that there is no wrong question. There, I, I don't even want to say stupid because there's no such thing as stupid, right? And it's certainly when questions are concerned. But anyway, Emily's going to show you some of the different ways that you can interact. I will remind you that if you go to autism-live.com, you'll see a lovely desktop. On the desktop sits a computer. Click on the little arrow on the computer. You can either watch the live show or the most recently recorded live show. And then to the side, you see a long white box. And if you put your cursor there and you type away and hit enter, it will show up on my screen, usually within a minute or two. So there's a slight lag. Uh, and you and I can have a conversation or you can have a conversation with our guests here in the studio. And, and I always like to remind you that when you ask a question, it sometimes helps other people to know what questions they can ask. I know years ago, I, had, I didn't even know what respite was. Hello. Um, and it wasn't until somebody said, hey, how many respite hours can I get through this and so agency? And I said, what you talking about, Willis? Um, you know, and it changed the way our, the, the whole next year worked. So ask questions, boy, when you ask questions, you are being of service to our entire community. Uh, absolutely. And hopefully you get an answer or resources that will help you to get your answer. That's really what we're here for. I always like to remind you that we are a free resource. When you, when you go to the website and you type in a question, you don't have to log in. We're not uh, calling your IP address. We have no way of doing that. Uh, we're not going to be spamming you or selling uh, any list because we don't have a list. This is total anonymity here. You get to write in and we don't know who you are. So if you want us to get back in touch with you, you will have to give us information. We don't have a way of getting it when you just uh, type in and there's no login and it's totally free. How much do we love that? All right. I also like to remind you at the start of the show that I am not an autism expert. Oh, my friends, no. <laughs> Um, but I am a mom and I am a former teacher and my son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. He is now 10 and a half. Uh, he is here with me today at the studio. I try to talk him into coming and being on the show for a few minutes and uh, he says, oh mom, I've been on the show so many times. And I said to him, not live, he doesn't want to, so we're not, we're not pushing that. But you know, I suppose it's possible he'll change his mind before the show is over. It doesn't matter, we've got a packed show full of wonderful guests anyway, because I want to go out with a bang today. Uh, right? So anyway, I do remind you, I'm a parent and I feel privileged to be able to be here because it is a way for me to pay forward. Oh, look, I'm going to get emotional already uh, to pay forward all of the good information that I've gotten over the years so that I have a child that I can have a conversation with, that I have a child who is able to go to school and have friends, uh, that I have a child who gets embarrassed by the things I say and do. What a lovely, lovely thing that that is for me. So I want to pay forward by helping you to get access to the things that you need to get access to, whether your parent teacher practice practitioner or you yourself are on the spectrum, we want to help you to find the resources that are there. Heaven knows there's not enough, right? But let's utilize what is there and let's move forward um, and make way for more resources and let our legislators know how important our families are. And let's face it, these are whole families in the autism community. So bless you for being here. Um, really, I, I can't say enough how much it means to me, those of you who are here with us and help us on a daily basis, this little show that could. All right. We like to start every morning with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym, and we try to shed some light on it. What does this term mean within our lives? What does this term mean towards progress for us with ourselves and with our young people who are on the autism spectrum? So today, Today's term is one of those really uh, annoying ones because it sounds like something else in another context.
context. Uh, of course, I'm talking about, and I gave it away yesterday, generalization. Uh, you know, I, the phrase that I always remember, my mother, you know, somebody would say something and my mother would say, well, that's just a sweeping generalization. So when I heard generalization, I thought that's what we were talking about. And, uh, and it was always a negative thing. If somebody's making a generalization, then it doesn't really, doesn't necessarily apply. It doesn't necessarily follow. When we talk about generalization and teaching skills with autism, it's a fabulous thing. Uh, so get rid of any negative connotations. Generalization is the thing that we're all working for. When, when you have accomplished generalization, it's time to set off the fireworks in the backyard because good stuff is happening. So what does it mean and how do we work towards it? Let's look at our actual definition first. Generalization, the occurrence of relevant behavior under different non-training conditions, i.e. across subjects, settings, people, behaviors, and or time, without the scheduling of the same events in those conditions. Yes, I can hear the toilet flushing in the background. What? What does this mean? I don't know, but I know what generalization means. So let's take a look at our working definition. This is why we do jargon every morning. Generalization, being able to apply what has been learned in new ways or situations that were never taught. So if you stop and think about this, one of the first things that I heard about ABA was, oh, don't do that. That'll turn your child into a robot and they'll only program res in responses and your child won't understand what he's doing or understand what he's saying. And I was horrified horrified but that isn't what good quality ABA does because good quality ABA strives for generalization so first we teach a child uh, a skill and we teach it in a very specific way but then we strive for generalization so that the child can take the, what we've taught them and apply it in so many different situations and take in new information and apply it in different ways. So if you stop and think about how difficult language is to teach, right? Um, if we just take the word red Oh my goodness, in the English language, all the different ways that red can mean, because red could be in color, but red could be this color, or red could be a brick red, or red could be, you know, the cherry red of uh, a Christmas tree. Uh, you know, I, I look around this room and I see so many different reds, right? And how, do, how are we possibly going to teach every single shade of red to any individual? We can't, right? That would be a life long skill but how about how about all of the other different ways that read can mean because I it can be that I read a book <sighs> right uh, so, you know, so many different connotations to red as well. We can't possibly begin to teach all of the different definitions of red and all of the different uh, representations of red. So we'll teach the color red and later on we'll teach about the skill of reading and the past tense of reading, which is red. But we need to be able to sort of prime the pump. We have to teach, the, teach this to a child in a way that they begin to to see that red means many things, right? And that's really what generalization strives to do. So we do this with every skill that we teach. Yesterday we talked about mastery and that if we say, all right, we're gonna pick a target. What do we wanna teach today? We wanna teach shoe tying. So we think to ourselves, before we even rush in and begin to teach shoe tying, there's a couple of things we wanna do. We wanna consider what will it look like when the child has mastered it, right? And we come up with a criteria of what it looks like when we can say, you know, this child can tie their shoes. But we also want to consider generalization because we don't want to teach the child just how to tie this pair of shoes. We want to teach the child how to tie every pair of shoes they may encounter in their life. Another great example, potty training. When we potty train, we want to make sure that we know what's mastery going to be. Um, because even a small child is going to occasionally have accidents, right? Uh, we want to leave room for the fact that they're not going to get it 100%, um, but that they, you know, that they got the concept and, you know, can do this pretty regularly, right? But we also have to plan for before we even begin to teach generalization. Otherwise, we have a child who only knows how to go to the bathroom in one toilet at home.
home. So if this child is at grandma's house visiting, they can't have a bowel movement. I can't tell you how many families that I've run into that have said, I don't know what to do because my child can't go to the bathroom in public. We're, you know, we went to Target and we were in the, in the bathroom there and my child just couldn't release, right? And what that is is a failure to have planned for generalization and you know, you got to go back and work on it and you can, but if you correctly plan every time you're going to teach a skill, if you correctly plan what's my mastery criteria and how are we going to strive for generalization, then once you see that the child's beginning to get it, in the example of toilet training, you plan your weekend and you, you know, you get that bathroom set up and you've got your rewards set up and you've got your salty snacks and you've got your liquids and you've got your timer and you're all set to go. But once you see that the child has got it and that they understand the concept, you've got to move to another bathroom. If you've got a second bathroom in your house, great. Within, you know, the first couple of days, you need to take them to that bathroom. Then you need to take them to Aunt Betty's house. And then you need to take them to your friend Fernando's house. And then you need to go to Walmart and use their bathroom. And then you got to, you know, go use the bathroom at the drugstore. I know it sounds like so much fun, but you end up with a child who can go to the bathroom on an airplane. You know, which can be very handy, I assure you. <laughs> so generalization, really one of the most important concepts that we need to understand when we're working with a child on the autism spectrum because whatever it is we're going to teach otherwise we're going to see that the child can only do it with mom or they can only do it with this therapist whatever fill in the blank of what the skill is or they can only do it in the morning and they can't do it at night um they can only you know uh do it in second grade but they go to the third grade teacher and suddenly the skill has gone poof right so generalization and when you get generalization I think of it as being a sponge because now your child is applying what they've learned and you don't, you're not teaching anymore. Your child has learned how to learn and taken the information and sort it out. It's like they're a computer bank that can pair things together and go, oh, I remember when, you know, this applies to this and they can pair things together and you go, look at that. Look at my child. Uh, and they truly fly at that point. Generalization, it has to be planned for from the first minute before you teach. Okay, now you see why it's so important. All right, we always like to have a question of the day for you today, no different. Uh, we're asking you today, what are you most looking forward to in the new year? You know, uh, even if we could stop and not think about the fact that the year is coming to an end, the television won't let us and the radio won't let us. They're recapping this year and so it's the, it's the new year, the new year is coming. But here's the good news. It's a chance to start fresh in so many different ways. If there's something that hasn't been going exactly right, it's, I, I mean, we can do this any day, but this is a great time to really be thinking about it and be pur purposeful for our, with our lives. And instead of just dreading things, I do believe in the positive assumptive questions. If we we ask ourselves, what am I looking forward to today? Our brain will come up with an answer. Well, I'm looking forward to, you know, being home and out of the traffic. Okay, but that's something to look forward to. And in all of our lives, and this is a very important thing for all of us to remember, we must have things to look forward to. Our children need to have things to look forward to. We need to have things to look forward to because when we don't, we aren't growing and depression can quickly overtake us, right? Uh, so we must have things to look forward to in the new year and uh, why not name them? Why not name them out loud and talk about them with our kids and say, what would you like to do? Uh, our kids have different ways of communicating because our kids are all different in the ways in which they communicate. But even if your child is nonverbal and non-responsive to put those things out there because we've learned time and time again on this big beautiful spectrum that a lot of times our kids are hearing more and processing more than we know so don't neglect that ask yourself and if you are a parent of a child of whatever ability keep talking and keep asking these kinds of questions it's amazing what ends up happening in the long run okay we always have a topic of the week our topic this entire week uh, very exciting topic surviving and thriving on the autism spectrum. We have to survive. We don't have a choice, right? Uh, there's too much to do. 
And thank God, because, you know, 50 years ago, when, it, when an individual was diagnosed with autism, it was game over. That was what the parents were told. That's what the entire family was told. That's not the case now. As our friend Lisa Ackerman from Taka says, it's no longer game over. It's game on. And there's a lot to be done. And we have to survive it. Let's face it, in the early years, it can be very overwhelming. And it's not just the early years. As, as we hear over and over again, there are different patches that you hit that are icy, black ice, right? And we got to survive them. That's goal number one. But while we're surviving, it's important to remember that there are times when thriving is just as important. We can only be in crisis mode for so long before things start to break down, whether it's a marriage that breaks down or somebody's health breaks down. We must get the survival under control and then we can start the beauty of thriving. And I assure you, I assure you that there is lots of thriving to be done on this spectrum. Okay, so some of the different things that we're going to be talking about today in particular... Uh, in just a little while, in about uh, 10 minutes, we're going to be joined by Hans Gillinger. He is a special education attorney. He joined us a couple of weeks ago. He has a very unique way of looking at things because he used to be an attorney who worked for school districts and represented school districts at IEPs and, and due process. And now he is a special education attorney working with families. So he's got insider information on both sides. And today he's going to be here with us just talking about about IEP tips. What are the tricks? What are the tips that we need to know to be successful? Whether it's knowing that the other side has got some tricks up their sleeve and knowing what they are can be helpful to us, or just a couple of small changes that we can make ourselves to empower our position at that IEP meeting. Because let's face it, it's important. It's important for us and for our kids that we leave that meeting and have secured legally what it is that our children need to succeed. Super duper important. Then uh, more today, as long as we have time with some holiday survival tips, ways that we're all going to get through these next two weeks and survive and thrive. And then of course, in the next hour, we'll be joined by I'm trying to say too much at one time. We're going to be joined by Dr. Jonathan Tarbox for a segment that we call Science Beat, and he's going to be answering your questions. You won't want to miss that. It's your last opportunity to get a BCBA's ear, and he's a doctor who has extensive experience in research and in treating autism. So last opportunity. It's all free, all here on Autism Live. Stick with us. We'll be right back after these messages. We're at the Toys R Us in Porter Ranch, California. And Emily and I are going to take a little tour around the store and find some great toys for some great kids. All right, let's go. Come with us. Yes. Okay, bring your dinosaur and come on. Let's go look at things in the game aisle. I okay. Know, I know you love games. I do love games. All right. So here we are in the game aisle, uh -huh. Emily, and I want to show you that there's all these games that you can get for kids of all ages. They're interactive and really remarkable. One of the hot toys this year and many other years is the Bop It toy. Okay, so what about the Bop It? It's so reinforcing. Well, you know what? It can be interactive. It can be a social game. It makes lots of noises. Sometimes they light up depending on the version. It helps to work on fine motor skills and it helps to work on fluency. This toy will grow with the child and in fact you can get it in different versions. This is a little bit more complex version and up top here we have one that's especially for older kids. It's called the Smash the Light. I would wait until a child is older to play with this one. So should we check out the Lego aisle? Yes. Okay, let's do it. Go. So how can we use Legos to help our kids? Well, they're really spectacular toys for our kids because they work on executive functions and planning. They're really colorful. You can work on colors and grouping and matching, counting, because they have the little dots on the top. And if you have a younger child, you can start with the Duplo toys that are compatible with Lego and will, they don't have the choking hazard. So then as the kids get older, What's great about Legos, it looks like, is that there's all sorts of themes. We've got movies here yeah. and video games, so the kids can really connect with what's personal to them. So Legos are amazing, but what else do we have to see? Uh, let's put some educational toys in the leapfrog aisle, shall okay. we? Okay. Okay, so what do you have here? 
Well, we're in the leapfrog aisle. This particular toy, very popular this year, is a leap reader. It comes with a little pen, and it tells us that we're going to read, write, and listen, all skills that we want to work on with a child. This pen that's in this box, you can put it over different pages in the book. It will read aloud to the child. They can trace their letters. It reinforces them for doing a great job. It's a really spectacular toy for our younger kids that are working on reading, writing, and listening. This looks like a lot of fun and a really great way to help our kids learn to read and write. Absolutely. What else are we going to play with today? I think we should take a trip down the functional pretend play aisle. This is where you're going to find all the things that are like real, but the toy version. So okay. I've got this lovely set here that's all fresh vegetables, so I'm teaching nutrition at the same time. They're all appropriately colored, but I've got a knife so I can be cutting them too. This is really great play for a young child. Shannon, I heard you got some toys that I get to play with now. Yes, I'm going to take you to the demo table. <laughs> we're going to let Emily play with some toys, and we're going to be giving some of these toys away on the show. But they're not just any toys. These are toys that are featured in this year's Toys R Us toy guide for differently abled children. And this is put together with the help of our friends at Leco Tech. So what do all these different icons mean? These are different icons that tell us what skill this toy might help to develop in our children. So can I play with the toys now? Yes, it's time to play with the toys, Emily. So I think I recognize this guy. Yes, this is the ever popular and very sweet Elmo. But this is a very specific Elmo that teaches adaptive skills, like zippering. Yeah, yeah, almost, yeah, now try the zipper. <laughs> and so we get the reinforcement of Elmo talking to us when we do these things. There's a Let's keep playing so it encourages okay. the child to continue to interact. And he's very reinforcing. When he <laughs> giggles, I just want to hug him and play with him some more. Okay, so moving on, let's look at some Melissa and Doug toys. These are incredible toys. They'll okay. last several different generations because they're made out of good quality wood. Awesome. And let's start with a lace and trace toy. Now, I happen to know that you love turtles, I Emily. do love turtles. And this is a set of farm animals lace and trace. And the child can pick out a color that they like for a lace. All right. And there are lots of different things that they can do with this. And I know it might seem like this is an old-fashioned toy, but you know, sometimes the old-fashioned toys are the best toys. Because what you're doing right now, Emily, is that you're using a lot of hand-eye coordination and you're using the pincer grasp. This is a precursor to writing right here. If you've got a child who's having difficulty holding a pencil, this is a really reinforcing way to work on this. And it comes in lots of different things. And then also for Melissa and Doug, we have this amazing switch and spin. Love this so much. This is a great cause and effect toy. As we start to put the gears together, we notice that when, when you turn one, another one can turn. You can rearrange this and do it in lots of different ways. There are 10 design boards, so you don't don't have to just do fish, there are other things that you can put there instead. That's awesome. Kids love this toy, and it's another Melissa and Doug toy. Cool. Alright, let's take a look at some fun games. So I found this game, and it's called Fibber. So Shannon, I'm going to need you to put on your fibbing uh, glasses. I want to fib. Alright, so this game is totally <laughs> reinforcing, and it helps our kids to work on lying. Yes, and that's something we really, I know it sounds strange, but we want to work on that because being able to tell a lie is something that helps with safety issues. And also being able to tell if somebody else is lying is a really useful life skill. What you need to do is get rid of your cards without trying to grow your nose. Kind of like Pinocchio. Okay. But if you get caught... Ah. And so eventually you can have a whole string of noses attached to the end of your nose. Very colorful. Again, we can be working on the colors. Kind of hilarious. Uh, a kid's going to want to play this with mom or dad mm -hmm. and see that mom is Pinocchio telling lots of lies. I like this game a lot. This is a great game. We've had a really great time at Toys R Us, and all of the toys that you see here on the table, we're going to be giving away on the show. So stay tuned to find out how you can win one of these great toys. Welcome back to Autism Live. Again, we have to thank all of the people who participated in our Festival of Toys and who generously donated. And at the top of that list is Toys R Us. Uh, they were so sweet to us, in particular the Toys R Us in Porter Ranch, California, that they allowed us to come and film all that and donated all of those toys. All of those toys that are on that table, we actually donated those toys. So uh, some of you are, are getting a toy that was actually opened because we demoed it for the thing 
and and you're and and so it was us that was please know that it was just us for a couple of minutes played with the toy and then we're sending it off to you um and we thank toys r us for donating those really amazing toys and to all of the toy companies who participated with us and all of the other companies who participated with us for our holiday giveaway extravaganza just really heartwarming and wonderful and we've started to get the messages from all of you who've been receiving these gifts and are enjoying them already and i know some of them are wrapped in under trees and we'll look forward if you have received something from us in this holiday giveaway extravaganza we encourage you to it's not required but we encourage you to send us a picture of the person who received the gift enjoying the gift that will make our day and make our year um, a couple of quick things um, because I know we're going to be joined by Hans Gillinger in just a few minutes but holiday survival tips I wanted to talk and we've got a bunch of questions I, I'm going to try to get to as many of them as we can when we have uh, Dr. Jonathan Tarbox with us but one of the things that somebody was asking about was specifically about skills and normally at this time in the morning I have Dr. Adele Nadowski here who was one of the co-creators of skills uh, she is already away on a holiday break and we hope that she's having a wonderful time with her family but I I when I talk about holiday survival tips one of the things that can be really hard is if any of you are experiencing a loss of services if your child goes to school and that's the main core component of the services that you receive and then suddenly it's like whoa it's fabulous we have a holiday break and we don't have to be anywhere oh no we don't have anywhere to be and we don't have anything to do and my child is like you know losing all of their skills and I'm losing my mind right Unfortunately, that can become the reality at the holiday time. So, first of all, I want to say, you know, Susan Campbell Cross, uh, who was here from Shape Magazine, the lifestyle editor, had said the other day, one and done, have one activity every day to do, whether it's you know, for those of us with kids on the spectrum, that may be taking a walk around the block. That may be going for a drive and looking at lights, right? One and done in terms of activities. But I want to add to that, that, you know, that's just a pure fun activity, although make that a learning opportunity, right? Um, it, whatever it is your child is working on. If your child is working on colors, that you're identifying which colors that you see. If your uh, child is working on, uh, you know, language, uh, making them say one and two and three words together whatever it is they're working on you're building on it while you're working while you're driving around looking at the lights but this is also a great time this moment right now to try the trial of skills honestly because you you can get a 14-day trial on the 15th day they'll charge your card although there there's two different types of trials for skills the first one is that you give your credit card number and for 14 days it's free and if you cancel within that 14 days you don't get charged anything if you don't cancel on the 15th day they will charge you right um, but 14 days is a really good trial to go in there and say okay it, what if what if I were going to devote a little bit of time every day and I was going to teach my child a skill or three skills? I wouldn't start with a great deal, but empower yourself with what if I was going to teach one skill? Uh, or what if I was going to work on one behavior that's driving us all batty? Because you can go into the behavior inter plan intervention plan builder in skills, uh, all part of that free trial, right? So that's the one if you give your credit card number. There is another one. I don't, you know, you you may be fine with giving your credit card number. I'm always, I have trepidation about that because I forget to cancel things. You know what I mean? And if I'm unsure to begin with, which is why I'm looking at the trial, you know, I'm, I'm not always sure. So there is a skills light that you can go to um, and you can get a 14 day trial. You don't have access to everything, um, but you can tootle around and get a feel for what's there to see if you want to give your credit card number. So that is the second option. Uh, but this is a great time to do this because you're in a transition where your child has been doing things one way, going to school, and now, you know, you're going to start something new. And I'm always very mindful of this. It, uh, we set 
precedence with our kids. So uh, this morning, my child had to get up just as early as he does every morning that he has to go to school because he had to come here. Now, a lot of parents would be like, oh, you know, that's a hardship. And I was not thinking of it that way at all. I was thinking, great, because I'm setting him up for, and tomorrow morning, I'm going to have exciting stuff for him to get up to because I know that all too soon, he's going to want to stay up late and then sleep late, and I'm going to get off track, right? This is a great time today to put, to say, we're in holiday mode and to claim what that is and holiday could mode could be we're we're going to say that in this week this is what we're working on what is it is it potty training is it tying shoes is it learning how to ride a bike is it eye contact you know pick the skill and then you can use ibt trainings to learn the techniques and you can use skills that 14 day free trial of skills teach the skill pick one Pick one and you will feel empowered. And I, I really think that you'll make progress in a week. And maybe you want to add another one next week. You know what I mean? It depends on what the skill is. But set yourself up for a happy new year. Set yourself up to be a strong person on your team or on your child's team, right? Uh, when we do that, we empower ourselves. And that self-esteem for us, that self-esteem for our kids, you can't put a price tag on that, right? Okay, that's our holiday survival tip for today. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, hopefully we'll have Hans Gillinger for you. Stick with us. You say hi, and we say hi. Let's get wild, let's get wild. Let's get, let's get, 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 let's get wild. Welcome back to What's Left. We're enjoying some wine. We're going to make some fake bourbon chicken Yay. tonight. Um, but we're not using bourbon. It's not gluten-free. So what we're doing, and Kristen, you're doing a great job at pounding and getting out all of your energy on that chicken. So go take it out. I know. You know, how many of us moms are at a park or we're at a grocery store and somebody walks up to you and, you know, your child's having a meltdown and, you know, having not one of those fun days. This is a great thing to come <laughs> home to. You would come home and really pound that chicken and you would feel so much better. <laughs> Oh, uh, <laughs> basically, it kills two birds with one stone. You're making a great meal for your family. Yes. And you're feeling great. You're feeling better about that jerk who said, why, why can't you get your kid under control? Absolutely. Awesome. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take all your pounded, aggressive chicken <laughs> and start to saute it in, um, in the skillet. And I'm just going to add a little bit of my grapeseed oil. So I'm going to go ahead and just put this in. We love the way we're going to just try to brown this up and cook it a little bit. Just a little bit of salt and pepper on top. And we're just going to go ahead and brown this. Great, Kristen. Great job. I think we're almost all brown here, so I'm going to get your help over okay. at the cutting board, if you don't mind. The cutting station. The cutting station! We're going to cut this in about a third slices. You go chop it up, okay. and I'm going to start on the sauce. Okay. We're going to take the orange juice water and add that in. And I'm going to measure out um, the fake soy sauce, a uh, third cup. Add that in. Take in your ketchup and your brown sugar and go ahead and put that in. So in here is the red pepper flakes and ginger. So we're going to go ahead and add that in. So in the red pepper flakes, if you've got a kid that's really sensitive and uh, doesn't like to bring a lot of heat to the kitchen, you can definitely omit that. That's not a problem. And then my favorite, as much garlic as tolerated. And the last thing that we're going to do, um, and as we get this heated up on the skillet, is we're going to pull this in, thicken to a sauce, and add in the arrowroot to thicken it. So we're gonna go back to the frying pan, woohoo, and put in our sauce, and we're gonna bring it to a boil, and that's when I'm gonna add the arrowroot. What arrowroot does uh, for everything, like when we're baking with gluten-free uh, flours, this adds kind of the oomph to hold it together. Our arrowroot is also a great sauce thickener. So let's go in and add the chicken. Thank you again for helping get this all together. I made extra sauce because I'm a saucy girl. So we made a really nice meal here tonight. We're talking just the right flavors, right texture. So I'm going to serve you up to what we're going to have for dinner, if that sounds good Yay. to you. Yes! So, I always love coming I out. <laughs> so what we made over here is just really some, what I call my dirty rice. And it's just uh, some of the um, really nice different spices. I use a little red pepper flakes in that as well. Um, Beaumont parsley. 
and uh, just salt and pepper. It's really good. simple. And uh, some of my favorite, which is uh, zucchini saute. So I'm going to just go ahead and serve you up, and you can get to be my guinea pig Yay. once again. I will always be a good guinea pig <laughs> anytime you cook. Bon appetit, my friend. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you for joining us at Autism Live. Chris and I had fun with you today. I always have fun. Thank it you. It is. It's great. And we had fun with you, too. And if you have questions or want to see us cook some more different dinners, um, just email us. You can email us at autismlive at gmail.com. Or go to Facebook, facebook.com slash Autism Live. Or Taka Now. Uh, Taka's got tons of recipes, over 2,000 recipes ready for you to come and explore and have some fun. And thanks to Holly for this great uh, bourbon free bourbon chicken. And we'll see you next time on What's Love? Bye guys. You say hi, we say hi. Let's go out, let's go out. Let's go, let's go, let's go out. Welcome back to Autism Live. If you are just tuning in, we are, I'm, I'm going through doing things multitasking, shouldn't. Um, we are in Los Angeles and the show is live in, a, in the suburbs of Los Angeles. And this morning in Los Angeles, it's Friday, so it should be a day when traffic is less, right? But it's the Friday before a holiday. And on top of that, there have been several accidents. So there, pretty much every freeway that we're near is con congested and backed up. So I believe that Hans Gillinger is on his way, but uh, stuck in traffic, which is completely understandable because I myself was stuck in it earlier today. So we will hope that he will get here in time for us to be sharing with him on the show. But I'm going through some of the questions that you guys have written in the last week and overwhelmed um, by the questions that are here and, and trying to figure out what to save for Dr. Tarbox to answer and what I can do with out him being here. Uh, so I tried to figure that out. Okay, but I'm going to take this question right here. Question. With Obamacare, how is this going to affect ABA therapy? What does this mean for our children? What if they are on Medi-Cal? Great, superlative, spectacular question. Okay, it's a little bit different for every individual, right? Big, beautiful spectrum. Everybody's different, and so is the insurance, even with Obamacare. Um, one of the great things that's happening with Obamacare is, though, that there is no pre-existing condition. So for many people who were out there who were terrified of including autism on their child's insurance, uh, because back in the day, that was something that we all worried about because once your child was labeled with autism, if you move jobs, it could be a pre-existing condition and then you were going to be out of luck in a day when it was going to be covered, right? All these what if, what if, what if, what if. That no longer is an issue. Don't feel that your child will be stigmatized within the insurance industry if you get the diagnosis included. Now, um, Obamacare specified that there were 10 essential health benefits, and one of the 10 essential health benefits was behavioral health. So ABA was supposed to be covered. Unfortunately, Kathleen Sebelius, I know everybody's been mad at her about the website, um, you know, I, I'm, I will be honest that I am very disappointed in her because she had the power to determine what that meant specifically. She, her office, and she was charged by the president to determine that it was up to her to determine what that meant, behavioral health specifically. She gave that power, as was her right, to the states. Um, unfortunately, what that has meant is that many states have decided to skirt the issue and not specify ABA creating more problems in individual states. So that's why I say it really depends. Now, you're not left to guess. If you go to the Center for, Center for Autism and Related Disorders, which is arguably the largest provider of one-to-one -one intervention, behavioral intervention for individuals with autism spectrum disorder in the world, um, as a service to their clients and to the world in general, they have set up a site. Julie Kornack is, did an amazing job with her team and we've had Julie on the show before but if you go to centerforautism.com you will see amongst all the other things that are on the main website there is a box that says affordable care act click on that you will be taken to a site where you can put in your state you can put in your I think you can put in your zip code but in any case you can also put in who your provider is what company you have your insurance through and it will detail for you 
you what the different plans are before you ever go on to the, the website to pick a plan. It will detail which ones are going to provide ABA and which ones aren't. So you don't have to guess. Uh, it's really a remarkable service uh, that they've done for you. So that's at centerforautism.com. Click on the Affordable Care Act tab and it will tell you what your individual situation is. Now, Medi-Cal. Uh, and this is one of those things that we're, 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 I think the jury is still out, although at this moment in time it looks rather bleak, because there used to be something called the Healthy Families uh, Program, and with all of these different uh, covered California, they took the healthy, and, and a lot of people had their ABA coverage through those healthy families. And um, they, they got rid of that. And they said to them, don't worry because we're going to put it into Medi-Cal. And then they didn't. And I don't know why, and I think they still have time to amend that, but it, at my understanding at this time is that it is no longer in Medi-Cal. I hope I'm wrong, and if somebody has information to the contrary, please educate me, but that was the last word that I heard from the expert that we had talked to. But that does not mean that you do not have access. If you are, were eligible for Medi-Cal, then you are absolutely eligible for services through the regional center here in California. So definitely make sure that you are a regional center client and that you are talking to them about what services and how you're going to get things paid. It's going to mean a lot of running around for all of us and determining where our funding source is. But in a lot of states, it's sort of, you know, it's that ladder of, okay, you know, start here. This is going to be the easiest. See if your insurance provider is going to cover it. And if they don't, then you bump up the next space on the ladder and are, is there uh, a government insurance that's going to pay for it. No, is there a government um, service that will fund it that isn't insurance? Um, and then you move up to grants and things like that. But there are funding sources and no one should give up and say, look, it's just not, it's not there for us. Um, I, I always believe where there's a will, there's a way. And the wonderful news is my child it was uh, a product of the regional center that he got all of his ABA funded, well, by, by the regional center and by his school district. I must say that. Um, the regional center was incredibly good to us, and, and I'm forever in their debt for making sure that my son got what he needed. And, of course, we saw that the amount of money over the period, you know, after the economic slide, there was less and less money within the regional center. Um, and other families that came after us, because we came in just at the right time before everything, you know, hit the skids, uh, other families came later than us, weren't able to get the amount of funding because there just wasn't enough. There were more families and there was less funding. The nice thing is that in a lot of these cases that insurance can take some of the weight off, but there is still funding at the regional center. There's just fewer people who require it because more people will be covered by insurance. So if you're one of the people who isn't covered by insurance, you know, you still have the regional center. and and on paper, at least, there is more opportunity for families who have been left out of the insurance. But I hope that um, Kathleen Sebelius, I, I don't know, after she finishes the website, maybe, you know, she's done. But I hope she buys a vowel and realizes that, you know, in giving states this power, and maybe it's not up to her anymore, but uh, one of our legislators needs to know, our president needs to know, the people who fought for that behavioral health being one of the 10 essential benefits, it is clear to everyone, and not just people with autism, but to everyone who fought for that, that ABA was to be included in that service. And for any governor of any state that decides that they don't feel that it does, they're leaving themselves open to a class action lawsuit and and i and i urge people to let your governor know that um that they are getting in the way of our children getting the help that is essential and been scientifically proven to be effective and shame on them shame on them um and to the governors who said no we know what this meant and we will stand by that and we need to make these services available to people and make it affordable 
hippie, a uh, yippie, hippie, uh, hooray for you, and there's a place in heaven for you. So I hope that answered your question. But again, centerforautism.com, click on the Affordable Care Act tab, and you can find out more information. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back after these messages. So the holidays are fast approaching and you might be looking for a fun cookie recipe you can make with your kids. Well, thankfully, Breads from Anna has given us a great sugar cookie recipe that we can make that's gluten free. So let's get started. Here's some of the things you'll need. For the dough, you'll need one and a half cups of vegetable shortening, two cups of sugar, two tablespoons vanilla extract, one tablespoon almond extract, four eggs, three cups of Breads from Anna dairy free flour, two cups potato starch, two teaspoons baking powder, and one teaspoon of salt. And for the icing you'll need a half a cup of shortening, a half a cup of butter, one tablespoon vanilla, four cups confectioner sugar, and two tablespoons of almond milk. To start with we're going to just mix together our liquids. So we've got our shortening, eggs, our vanilla, and our almond. And we're just going to go ahead and cream these together. So once that's all creamed, we're going to go ahead and add our dry ingredients, starting with our breads from Anna flour. And we've got our potato starch, and we've got our baking powder and salt. We're also going to go ahead and put in two cups of sugar. All right, once that's all blended together, we're going to go ahead and cover this and chill for about an hour or overnight in your fridge. So it's been an hour, our dough should be cool. So we're gonna try to roll this out to about a half inch to about three quarter inch in thickness. So while I'm rolling out the dough, I've preheated the oven to 400 degrees. And I have a baking stone preheating in the oven that I'm gonna set these on. But if you don't have a baking stone, that's okay. You can just use a cookie sheet with parchment paper. Now you're gonna take your cutter and just cut out all your cookies. All right, so I'm gathering my cookies. My little dudes here. That's good. Let's go ahead and put these in the oven. And these should be good to go in about six minutes. So while our cookies are baking, we can go ahead and start making the frosting that we're gonna use once they're done. So we're gonna need our shortening. We're gonna go ahead and add our butter. We're gonna add our vanilla. We're gonna start to blend this. Okay, so once we've creamed these together, we're going to go ahead and add our sugar just a bit at a time. And last but not least, we're going to add our almond milk just to soften it up a little bit. All right, that looks pretty good. So once our cookies are done baking and we've given them time to cool, we can go ahead and frost them all. Okay, so our cookies are ready. Let's go get them. These look pretty good. Now's the part where you get to be creative with your kids. Feel free to ice these in different colors, with sprinkles, however you want. We've got our cool cookies here, our homemade icing. All right, these look great. For more of these recipes and to possibly win some of your own breads from Anna, go to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash autism live and we'll see you there soon. Thanks for joining me. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're so thrilled and so fortunate to have with us special education attorney Hans Gillinger. Thank you and welcome back. It's my pleasure to be here once again. Well, we're thrilled to have you here and I said we wanted to kind of go out on a bang. This is our last show of 2013. You uh, have an amazing perspective because you used to represent school districts, correct? I did. I did for six years. I represented school districts. So I, I've come to know how school district decision makers and their attorneys think and, and what's effective with uh, with those folks and now you represent families that's right who have children who are on the autism spectrum or young adults that are on the autism spectrum and you can be I, I would argue just so much more effective because sitting at the IEP t table you have experience on both sides now mm -hmm. yeah. so you said you would join us today to talk about some IEP tips for 
for us. So give us a, a, a brief sample of what it is we're going to be talking about. Sure. We're going to look at, uh, at several things. Uh, uh, we have uh, some tricks about the way that services can be uh, designated that uh, uh, can really be a trap for the unwary. Uh, there's uh, lots of different uh, tricks about uh, frequency, duration, amount, and this sort of thing. Which is mystifying to parents. It is. We look at that and we, it's this big equation and we go, okay, and that? we don't really want to do the math on it, so you're going to help us to understand that. Right. What else are you going to tell us about? Well, a lot of times we hear things like, uh, oh, you don't need any more speech because that's already embedded within the program. Mm, Remember this? Okay. Yes. So I got a trick for how to deal with that situation okay. too. Great. So we're going to be talking about these things specifically with Hans, and if people want to get a hold of you because they have questions afterwards is there sure. a place where we can send them to contact you okay yes uh, you can contact me at 818-653-2625 or at hans at gillinger and associates.com okay and you are primarily in the los angeles area but if people have questions and want to consult with you from other places you have right. the ability to go correct? yes of course i have clients in orange and in la counties okay uh, actually san bernardino riverside uh, as well okay great so we're going to talk some more with hans we're going to take a break and we're going to come back and talk more about these tips and tricks that we need to have in order to have a successful iep stick with us Hello, I'm Hans Gillinger, and I started my special education and civil rights law practice to help children and families lead a normal life. One of the best ways to a normal life is for a child to have an education. We understand that many parents are in a terrible place, wondering if their child will learn to read or go to college or lead an independent adult life or even say I love you. Your lives will get better as your child's position improves. Your child's position will improve with proper services. It can get better, and it will get better. One of the unique aspects of my practice is that I spent six years representing school districts in special education matters. As a result, I know how school district decision makers and their attorneys think, and how to effectively deal with them. There is no question that the results we obtain for families are better as a result of my background in school district defense. As any parent that has dealt with school districts can tell you, school districts are already dealing from a deck stacked in their favor. Enlisting an attorney insider on your team does more than just level the playing field. It gives you the advantage. We are honesty, reliability, and trust. We achieve results. We offer free case evaluations, so we encourage you to reach out for the help and empowerment that we love providing. Thank you. Welcome back. We have here with us, as you just saw, Hans Gillinger. Am I saying it right? You are. Okay. And you are a special education attorney. So thrilled to have you here, especially towards this end of the year, because everybody's in some sort of transition at this point. Right. You're either getting ready for an IEP or you just had the IEP or, you know, we're all in some sort of transition at this mm -hmm. point and we don't want to wait till the last minute to get ready. And you've got some great tips for us. And, and you mentioned before the break that there's this whole idea of how the service services are delivered mm. and I really I'm still mystified by this on the IEP there's the there's that part where they say you know they'll describe the services and then it says frequency duration and amount, and amount. yes and <sighs> it's math it's it's it does feel like math and and there's some tricks associated with it okay and, help uh, us one that's uh, really specific to a Los Angeles Unified School District which I'm sure a lot of your listeners uh, are in uh, what they've taken to doing in the last few years is for frequency they're giving their providers some latitude in how they implement the service mm -hmm. by designating it as 1-5 for frequency so that means one to five sessions <sighs> and then it says per week uh, at let's say 60 minutes per session okay so you got one to five 60 weekly okay and what that ends up meaning is that you are guaranteed as few as one 60-minute session of, let's say, OT, if you consent mm -hmm. to it, and as many as five 12-minute sessions 
of O2. Oh. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it, you probably can't be very uh, efficacious in terms of service delivery uh, benefit from that if you have, let's say, three minutes of that 12 minutes going to establishing instructional rapport. Right. And then you've got a, the, the wrapping up and, and leaving process, you have about eight minutes of instruction. Uh, and I think most uh, experts would tell you that that is not the same thing. Uh, no. One and five. So uh, it's actually the topic of a class action lawsuit that I'm working on right now. And wow. uh, I'm actually looking for uh, potential class claimants okay. who, um, who have IEPs with LUSD that indicate 1-5 on your services. And what I'm trying to do is bring about a change to the way LUSD does business, wow. changing their IEP documents and requiring this change uh, because parents are in a disadvantage. Absolutely, and I can absolutely see that getting past me as a parent. And I like to be really diligent, but I could see thinking, okay, you know, what's the difference? And yeah. actually, I would I would think that it meant my child's either going to get one 60-minute session or they're going to get two 60-minute right. sessions or five 60-minute sessions. And, and even that was scary to me, but it's even worse if it's going to yes. be one and it's going to be however long they decide to be. It's, it's too much difference to uh, be okay with for most parents. Most parents would not be okay with that option of five 12 minute sessions and probably not four either. No. And so, uh, you know, by accepting it, you, you subject yourself to that risk. And this is a problem. It's not, uh, you know, a, a small uh, issue. Uh, and so I encourage you, if you have uh, kids with IEPs that reflect that, uh, that designation, 1-5, give me a call and okay. be a part of the solution, uh, the right. class action that is going to bring about the change uh, to, to get a, a solid, yeah. reasonable, understandable offer. You know, it just makes me so mad sometimes because they, they sometimes decisions seem to come from on high that don't make sense. Is that right? It just doesn't make sense to do a lot of the things that you need to do in that way, right. whether it be speech or OT, and how disruptive to just keep coming and taking a child out of the classroom each time you're doing that. Okay, so contact Hans if you are in the LAUSD Unified School District and you have that on your IEP. Be a part of this change. And then you also talked uh, uh, about other tips that you had sure. to give us. Help us out. Yeah, and while we're in goals, uh, I, I'm going to uh, tell you another one. This is near and dear to my heart. Goals are important mm -hmm. because uh, goals are what drive the placement and services. And so, you know, you have to ask yourself what's required uh, to uh, make reasonable progress on these goals. What services are required? And so, uh, what the school district is essentially telling parents, they're assuring parents that they're giving enough service to make that progress on the goals, okay? And parents are in a position of having to trust that, okay? And the only way that they can verify whether uh, progress has been made is if you know the starting point, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. This is what's called baseline performance yeah. relative to the goal, okay? Right. Uh, a lot of school districts uh, will state your baseline performance in different terms under different conditions than the goal requires. That's and, horrible. And so let me give you an example. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is a non-educational example. Uh, let's say that the school district uh, uh, proposed a goal to my mother that I would lose 80 pounds in a year's time. Okay. It's not an educational goal, but... Right. Um, for my mother to know whether that's a reasonable goal, she'd have to know where I'm starting from, how much right. I weigh. But the trick is this, the school district will put as a, the baseline, Hans has a size 17 inch neck. Mm. That has something to do with my weight. Right. There's a relationship between the two, right. but it doesn't tell my mom whether that's a good goal. If instead she learned that I weighed 180 pounds, she would realize that would be wildly uh, dangerous right. right? and it wouldn't be a good goal. So uh, it's a bit hyperbole, but uh, it's, it, it underscores uh, the point. Okay, so they're, they're, what they're doing is taking the baseline and putting it in different language so you can't compare apples to apples and oranges right. to oranges. So like without, uh, with prompts to without. Uh, so any condition that is required, um, you have to watch for that, okay? okay. Also while we're in goals, um, the disjunctive set, the word or, you have to really watch for because 
uh, if it says, uh, let's say, uh, the child will have, uh, you know, by year's end, the child will carry on a, a, a three-part conversational exchange with an adult or peer, uh -huh. that means that the goal can be accomplished and they can tell the parent that the goal was met if the, the child can do it with an adult, which right. is a far easier thing to do than with a peer. My goodness, I'm, I'm really seeing how important it is to be working with an attorney because I'm sure that that's somewhere in my IEP. I'm going to go home and look at it and mm -hmm. see. And, I, and it, these things just don't occur to you because yeah. how can they? There's too many things going on at the same time. So really important that we uh, have this information, Hans. This is absolutely great. And, and in terms of, I know the last time you were here, we were talking a little bit about stature at at the IEP mm -hmm. and feel and walking in and being empowered and all those things do you have any tips and tricks for us about sure. how either what the school district might be doing to put us in a, at a disadvantage or things that we can do to put ourselves at, sure. at an advantage. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I have a whole procedure, a protocol of what I do when I enter the room at an IEP. Uh, uh, we, don't want, we don't want to give away all your secrets, though. No, of though, course, but, but, <laughs> but the, the trick is, is that you're on their playing field yes. and it's their home turf and they're inclined to give you an, a meeting agenda and tell you what's going to happen. And that's not acceptable for me. Uh, I am the one that tells people how it's going to go, and, and that really helps the parent. And so uh, that starts the you know upon walking in, you make eye contact with the decision maker immediately, mm -hmm. and you walk directly over to them. I stop and manipulate an object for no purpose, <laughs> just to show this. that I own it. <laughs> and uh, it might be a music stand along the way, just close it up. And it just, it, without saying it, it says, I own this part of the room, okay? Yeah. And then you talk to them, uh, you go sit down, and uh, it, there's a, you know, a whole process of confidence, of, of uh, evaluating from a psychological standpoint, is this the type of person that's going to say or not say what I want them to say or not say right. by giving them a compliment. You know, some teachers are obviously in this for the right reason. Yes. I really appreciate what you're doing for my client. He's lucky to have you. Yeah. That might be enough to get a teacher to say or not say what I want them to say or not say. Right. On the other hand, sometimes you'll evaluate people as the type that if you give two quick barbs, right. you know, ad hominem assault perhaps, <laughs> this is going to be the type of person that is going to cross their arms and get right. so angry that they're going to be muttering under their breath and they're going to be incapable of saying or not saying what I want them to say or not say. Right. So really looking at it psychologically and setting yourself up for success, That's depending right. on the circumstance. If, if they give me an agenda, the district, I say that's well and good. The parent's agenda is this. And then because if you think about it, the, the person that tells you what the rules are is, yeah. is the ship's captain. And the ship's captain is the one that determines where the ship goes. Yeah. And so if you become the captain, then you direct the, uh, the IEP. And so it's a very powerful um, and, and very different approach than I think you could pull off without representation. I'm just thinking about back on uh, one of my, after, I, it wasn't like the, the first or the second IEP, but I think it was around the third IEP uh, where I thought that I was getting good at it, mm. right? And, I, you know, I wasn't, clearly I wasn't. But they came in and they said, okay, you know, so this, you know, this is your IEP, you know, do you have an agenda? And I was completely unprepared for that. Mm -hmm. Now I always am. Yeah. Uh, and I sort of scope out, what, you know, am I leading or are they leading? and I have my agenda no matter what mm -hmm. but uh, was that then do you in your professional opinion is that like somebody trying to throw me in the deep end of the pool and see if I can swim yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> interesting and, and you know sometimes if you've got a collaborative person at, at the district uh -huh. uh, administrator with whom you could work uh, I also find it helpful to pull aside that person before the IEP and just lay the cards on the table yeah. you know my client wants an in-home program what does your client needs? Well, yeah. he, you know, uh, the district needs, you know, his butt in a chair for a couple hours a day for yeah. ADA. Oh, okay, we can work with that. This sort of thing. And then if you come to an agreement about where we both want to end up, then it's just a nod and a sort of a, a wink as yeah. it happens. And then it just happens sort of naturally and, and you're not worried about yeah. the direction. So. 
That could be helpful too. And the last time you were here, you were talking about, you know, what kinds of circumstances do the do the school districts fight, and what circumstances that they don't. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really stuck with me that you said was that if they feel that the parent is going to be difficult, that that's a position of power for the parent. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us fear being the squeaky wheel. Yeah. Uh, we're so afraid that we're going to rock the boat and they're going to get mad at us and then they won't give us give our child something because they're mad at us. And I really appreciated hearing from you that it's a much stronger, and tell me if I'm reading it wrong, because what I walked away with was you're in a much stronger position if they fear the fact that you will pursue this. That's right. Parents, okay. plain and simple, they're viewed as varying degrees of risk, okay? okay. And uh, the more things you do to appear risky to the district, uh, the more value uh, you're going to get through IEP negotiations or settlement negotiations. Uh, it's, you know, it, it, you have to uh, convince the district that you're aware of your rights and that you are the type of person that's going to enforce them. Yeah. Uh, and, and unless you do that, then you're you can have the numbers played against you. And I just want to be clear for people who are watching who go, oh, this is just sickening that mm -hmm. we have to go through this kind of thing. I just want to say that no one is suggesting, I'm not suggesting, and I don't believe that Hans is suggesting, that you're trying to get something that you don't already legally have a right to. Oh, that's right. This is fighting for what is legally appropriate for your child. And it's, and it's really disappointing to think that people have to go in and fight, but that's the reality. And sometimes it makes the difference of whether your child makes progress for an entire year or not. And, and or so we, whether a family is even happy. If the child yeah. is not making a progress, doesn't have a solid educational component, yeah. uh, the, the child's you know, not, situation is not being furthered. And, and then the family is usually not in a good place when that happens too. So it, it's a really, uh, it, there's a lot of ripples to that. Yeah, and it's it's a tough time, you know, while you're sorting it out. And and I always refer to, you know, you know, girding yourself with armor to go in yeah. sometimes for an IEP. And it's it's disappointing to me as a former teacher that that's the way that it needs to be in some cases. But we do have to empower ourselves because. I, we have to empower our children and the fact mm -hmm. of the matter is is that if we don't and if we don't find people who will do it for us no one will the system requires parents to advocate for their children and uh, for a lot of different reasons uh, the parents cannot be in a position to to be effective in that advocacy uh, yeah. especially at the beginning and so uh, you know people say at an initial IEP does it make sense to bring in an attorney Absolutely. Yeah. You want to start with, uh, you know, your best foot forward. Yeah, start, start with guns so that you don't have to go to battleships. That's right. That's what I always say, you know, let them know. And and I, I remember one parent early on who said, you know, get the legal help that you can get. Mm -hmm. um, because and, and they had said, we took the college fund that the grandparents had and invested it in the kindergarten um, for the lawyer because we weren't going to get to college otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that child is going to go to college in just a couple of short years, and, and they have no regrets about that. Mm -hmm. So having somebody like Hans on your side to be able to help you to negotiate these difficult waters, uh, you know, uh, you'll save your stomach lining, yep. and you may save your child in the process as well, too. Absolutely. So, Getting an attorney involved is like voting in Chicago early and often. <laughs> I like it early and often. Uh, absolutely amazing. And again, we want to give out your information so that people who want to contact you, especially if you want to be a part of that class action lawsuit, mm -hmm. if you are in the Los Angeles Unified School District area and you have an IEP that has that frequency at 1-5, that's correct. be a part of that uh, class action lawsuit to help your child but to help others so that we can it, stop this. And it will cost you nothing. That's there the you go. <laughs> we like, that's the best part. We, right. we save the best for last. Okay. Okay, so how can people get a hold of you, Hans? Okay, so people can can call me uh, at 818-653-2625. Okay. Uh, they can also email me at Hans, H-A-N-S, at Gillinger and Associates, G-I-L-L-I-N-G-E-R, and Associates, and is spelled out, okay. dot com. Great. Hans, thank you so much, and we have to have you back again to tell us some more tips. It's really, too much fun. It is too much fun, and it's important information, and it really does empower us, so thank you so much. Appreciate you asking me to be here. All right, we're going to take a break, and we're going to be back with Dr. Jonathan Tarbox answering your questions. Stick with us. 
are here at the Los Angeles Zoo. We've got quite a group here. I've got my son, Jem, Mike from the A-Word, and Jack Riley, star of the A-Word, and Jessica. We've got a whole crew of people, and we're going to take a tour around the LA Zoo and see some exciting animals. Sound good, you guys? So remember what we talked about, that every time you do something good, I'm going to write it on my hand. When you get 35 of these, what are you going to get? Three hours of anything. Yes, it's not a secret. You can tell people. What kinds of things do you need to do to get a mark on my hand? Being kind. And good listening. Jem, can you show them where the, where the um, chimpanzees are? Can you point it out to him? Show Jack Riley. Tell us what your responsibilities are here at the LA Zoo. I am the manager of volunteer programs at the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association. I, I oversee the docents, the student volunteers, the general volunteers, and community service volunteers. Give us an overview of what kinds of things people can see at the zoo. There are lots of lots of animals to see. We have a lot of endangered. We are participate in a lot of conservation programs, and we offer a lot of education programs for our community, for uh, school groups, for members, uh, special needs. What kinds of accommodations can you make when somebody has specific issues? Uh, we have our special needs outreach program, and where we have a van that goes out into the community, and we bring a handful of animals to facilities that can't quite get to the zoo. So that could be a school, that could be a retirement community, that could be a hospital, uh, and there are some court courthouses that we visit as well. We bring a couple animals and we talk about them and it's kind of a fun experience. Um, so that's our outreach program. And then on grounds, we also have uh, tours and we offer special needs tours for people catered to their needs. We have our petting zoo, so you can go and you can pet some goats. We're here with From Autism Live and we were wondering if you could tell us what it's like to be a goat in the zoo. Really? And then we have our condor rescue zone, so you can go in and pretend you are a condor or you could be a biologist or you could be a vet and it's kind of fun. Thank you for all the work that you do here for, and for making it accessible for all of our kids. with Janet Jackson. Janet, tell us what your role at the zoo is. My role is a docent and we're volunteers. How did you learn all the things that you know? Well, that's the great thing about the Los Angeles Zoo. We have a special docent program. It's one of the most stringent ones in the in the country. Actually, it's UCLA accredited class. Well, it added so much to our visit to the zoo today. So I thank you for all your knowledge and, and all your giving to the community. Well, thank you because I had a special needs child too. And I think it's so important that they interact with animals and that helped my son when he was going through so much trauma that we saw that he was able to um, to grow and to expand a little bit and it just helped us as parents because we had a tool to use and we saw the love and the, and 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 the care that he was able to bring out just by touching animals and being around animals because there is no judgment there amen to that well thank you for paying it forward because you are I definitely saw you doing that today. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you for being here. What was hard for you guys today at the zoo, do you feel? Um, to be completely honest, I was about to say um, this is the easiest, best outing I can recall. My concerns are... Uh, I think we're sort of past elopement, but it's, it's always on my mind when it's just with the two of us out in a, you know, you can get 20 feet away if it's busy and be lost, you know, uh, be, be misplaced. But nothing like that happened today. Um, there were a lot of people helping me, of course. It was interesting for me because Jem hasn't been here since he was three, like right after we started therapy. And I remember that was hellish, the day that we were here. Sometimes I don't notice the progress until we're out someplace like this. Do you feel like that's true too? Yes. Today I was actually comfortable with him being 15, 20 feet away. And even if he wasn't holding uh, anybody's hand or anything, I was comfortable. And that's, uh, that, that's a new feeling. <laughs> I, I watched that and I said, man, there's no way we could have done that at that age. So he's doing really well. And I was so engaged by how Jack Riley is so aware of the circumstances around him. He's really doing great. Yeah, he, thank you. He's curious. He's, um, 
and he's just learned a lot. I mean, I, and I can't give enough credit to uh, Miss Jessica. Um, no disrespect to any of our other therapists, and she's been with him for the whole time. So that's a constant in his life, and uh, I dread the day when she's not. <laughs> it's always amazing. I, you know, we had our rock star on our team. There's always one therapist that just becomes a part of your family forever. What would you say to parents who are afraid to do it even with an aide? Um, I understand your fear because um, I've always had it. Um, but sometimes they surprise you. Uh, I know it's called a spectrum for a reason, and my son is not like any other son or daughter, and so I can't advise you on what might, may or may not happen. Uh, we were always worried about transitions. They're getting better because we do it, and explain what is expected before you get here. That's a one, uh, that was a hard lesson for me to learn, but every time I don't explain them the, to him the expectations, um, I have more problems, I have more transitional issues, but when he knows what transitions are he's gonna face that day, he handles it. So my advice would be talk it out, but come do it and, and uh, come again, even if it's a horrible experience, because it might be. You gotta do it the first time before you can do it the second time, so. I think in general, I mean, you know, I explained the expectations here and we carried it out of my hand. I agree with you, it's super duper important. I think it's good for us too, because then we know what we're expecting too. And they've we engaged each other a little bit, which I was very uh, happy to see. Thank you so much for coming and doing this play date with us. We had a really great time. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it, and uh, it was just a great experience. I can't wait to tell my wife how well he did. So, And let's do it again sometime. Okay, anytime. Okay. Welcome back to Autism Live. Quick programming note that in this hour, the gift that we're giving away is also from Institute for Behavioral Training. We're giving away one of those holiday survival kits, a series of trainings that will help a parent to be able to negotiate through the difficult things that happen within a holiday season. So make sure that you're watching for the word or phrase on the screen. Email it to us at this address that Emily's going to give you by 7 a.m. Pacific time tomorrow morning in this subject heading. You want to put the holiday IBT training and then in the body of the email put the word of the phrase that comes on the screen so wonderful wonderful thing but you must to win but you must give us that correct response by 7 a.m. tomorrow Pacific time in order to win that okay we have with us though right now in the studio Dr. Jonathan Tarbox he is the head of research and development for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders and he is also the director of the executive director the director, the executive director, uh, executive of, director, executive director of the um, Autism Research Group. I got so excited because I was on a roll with it, but it's a mouthful. <laughs> Autism Research Group is a fabulous organization that does research based on what will be some substantive and and usable for a parent. That's right. That's uh, our mission. Well, I love your mission. And so we should also give your website so if people want to go and learn about some of the things that you're doing. Right. So it's autismresearchgroup.org. And uh, you also have a great video out that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, Lost in Public. Yes. Giving you great skills for that you want to train and teach your child so that if they ever get lost in public that they'll be able to be re reunited with you using these skills. That's right. So wonderful work that they're doing. But Dr. Tarbox comes to us on Friday and he answers your questions and we also sometimes talk about research. We've had so many questions this week that we need to get to. So I'm going to start with this very interesting one. My granddaughter, two and a half years old, just diagnosed with autism. Uh, my daughter-in-law's sister is a behavioral therapist and she told them that the card curriculum which is based on discrete trial training is dis is based on discrete trial training she says that there may be elements of DTT in a good autism program but it would not be recommended today as the core program she says it encourages too much rote learning versus natural learning my son and his family live in San Salvador El Salvador Salvador. And I thought they would benefit from using skills until they were able to find a program. But 
they are dismissing skills based on the rote learning comment. Can you discuss this view of CARD? Sure, yeah, and it's a great question, you know, and this, this yeah. question comes up a lot, sort of what's, uh, what's the relative uh, place of discrete trial training versus more naturalistic teaching mm -hmm. procedures versus other teaching procedures like chaining, shaping, and things like that. Uh, how do they all sort of fit together within an ABA program or an autism treatment program for any individual child, given that child's unique age, functioning level, what their skill repertoire is, what their unique uh, strengths and uh, areas of need are. Um, and of course, the short answer is it totally depends and it needs to be customized to each individual child. Um, but another, uh, another, well, sort, sort of the basic thing to keep in mind here, the short, short answer is uh, uh, discrete trial training is the most evidence-based procedure, so the most scientifically supported procedure for teaching children with autism, okay? So yes, discrete trial training should be used and it's very important and just as true no really good quality aba program only uses discrete trial training anymore i mean okay can really, you say that again in case people miss that no great quality aba treatment program only uses discrete trial training anymore it just doesn't exist okay, okay? Uh, and and if you see a program doing that so you know keeping a kid in the chair for 40 hours a week and that's all they do it's a huge red flag okay, okay. nobody has done that for probably a couple of decades okay um, uh, good quality programs incorporate many other teaching strategies, including more naturalistic approaches. So we call them natural environment training approaches, mm -hmm. pivotal response training, incidental teaching, milieu teaching, play-based uh, teaching methods. All of these are um, ways of using evidence-based, scientifically supported treatment procedures, but incorporating them into more natural, flexible uh, interactions in the, ch in the child's natural environment. Uh, and so they're less structured, less contrived, but they're still very effective. But they're almost always combined with some amount of structured practice. And the name for that is discrete trial training. Okay. So it is an important component in it. Of course. But again, for people who, who, who miss that concept, you, if you are having ABA in your home and all they are doing is discrete trial training, you, you're not getting the right thing. That's correct. Absolutely. And, and you know, I can tell you that I, my child had the benefit of CARD. And so that's all I knew of ABA for the longest time. And then as I got more and more friends and they were having other ABA programs, I began to realize that we were calling the same thing blue and they were vastly different right right um, you know it's it's like somebody saying this is milk and setting in front of you some water that has some skim powdered milk <laughs> in it and and you know maybe it's got a little bit of the melamine that they were putting in candy instead of milk in China and they're saying this is milk and then you have a glass of whole milk that's organic and you taste the two and go these two things are not related right right so and, and I'm always concerned about parents misunderstanding, hearing about a bad ABA program and, and then dismissing Absolutely. all of the it's other ABA problem. programs. This to me is almost criminal right? Um, and, and it breaks my heart. It's a huge problem. And so and the second piece to the answer really for your viewer is um, skills is a curriculum, okay? Well, it's a lot more than that. It's an assessment, it's a curriculum, it's a progress tracking system. Um, uh, you can do behavior intervention plan, uh, functional assessment, behavior intervention, plan design all that stuff but I think mostly what they're referring to is the curriculum component of skills yeah. it's a curriculum that can be used uh, that can be used that can be used to, to decide what to teach and to plan what to teach but you can use any teaching procedure you want it's mostly content what it is is it says here's what your child already knows how to do here are a whole bunch of different things your child doesn't know how to do yet prioritize which one you want to teach then you choose the teaching method right. and so if you were really uh, poorly trained you could decide okay I'm gonna teach this particular lesson and I'm only gonna use discrete child training which would be a terrible idea or you could say I'm gonna teach that same lesson and only used pivotal response training mm -hmm. which would also honestly probably not be the best idea depending right. on the kid right, right. Um, and so uh, skills is, is, a, is a collection of content and so um, for this family of course we don't know the individual child and we don't know the individual family circumstance but in general for a two and a half year old kid newly diagnosed what skills is going to do is going to let the parents know here's all these different things that you can focus on teaching right. and here's how to prioritize them in terms of which one uh, develops first in typical development which um, which ones are more difficult or less difficult which skills are prerequisites for other skills because you don't want to work on something 
something if the kid doesn't have the prerequisite skills first, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's basically just a wealth of information. Um, and so if they want to take a more naturalistic approach to teaching it, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, if they want to take a more structured approach, that's fine too. They need to customize that for their individual child. Absolutely. And finally, uh, if they want to learn more about how to do all of this stuff, right, there's yes. IBT, right? And so there's a... Um, a training module in IBT now called Natural Environment Training, okay? And it's all about how to do ABA in less structured, more naturalistic ways. Uh, and so they can check that out um, and that will teach them here. Here's how to teach this stuff without using discrete trial. Absolutely. Thank you so much for saying all that. And I just, my, my little button at the end of this is don't let other people's misperceptions prevent you from getting the help that your child needs. That's right. So, uh, great. We're going to take a brief pause and then we're going to come back and have Dr. Tarbo answer more of your questions. Stick with us. Hello, fellow activists. In our last segment, we talked about step number four, run your own race, don't compare. Your child has their individual journey. Moving on to step number five, shore up spiritually. Now spirituality is a very loaded word. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I'm not talking about religion in the traditional sense. I'm talking about a practice, a belief system, or a ritual that speaks to your soul. Now that doesn't have to be found in a church or a synagogue, although it may well for you. It could be found out in nature. Your altar could be a redwood tree. Your hymns could be birds singing overhead. It's different things to different people. In the early days of Wyatt's autism, I don't know how I could have survived without my church. In addition to dealing with his diagnosis, I was dealing with my husband's battle with cancer, the aging of my parents who lived across the country, and their eventual passing. I knew I could find peace at least for an hour and a half sitting in the pew of my church. See, anything can become a spiritual practice if you approach it that way. And for me, it wasn't found in a sermon or in a religious doctrine, but in my fellow man. We'll talk more about that next. In the meantime, find out what speaks to your soul and keep the faith. Welcome back to Autism Live. So thrilled to have Dr. Jonathan Tarbox here with us for this last hour of the last show of 2013. I said we're ending on a bang. Uh, and he is answering your questions. Dr. Tarbox is the head of research and development at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, and he is also the executive director of the Autism Research Group. So uh, he's got multiple years of experience working with autism and uh, a great, a beautiful brain, I always just <laughs> like to say. Uh, to pick when we're asking questions. I, I, I was remiss though that I should have said, and I usually say it earlier in the show, that remember that no one on the show can give child specific advice, right? That that would be a disservice to our kids, that um, all of our kids are individual. And there's no way we could give enough information in this format to Dr. Tarbox for him to give child specific. But having said that, he can give us lots of different things to think about that can help us to get right. resources and help that we need for our children. Okay, so lots of questions about potty training this week, uh, and we have a show coming up uh, where we're just going to talk about potty training in January, but I started night toileting my seven-year-old. We set up a sticker chart, and he has woken up dry one time in a week, so I know he can do it. The problem is that he wakes up, when he wakes up dry, he gets his iPad for 10 minutes. I don't think he understands that contingency, and he gets upset and frustrated when I say, I, you can't get the iPad because you're wet, but we can try again tomorrow. I also offer other items like his Nintendo, but I feel like I'm creating more anxiety for him. And I love this question. I was saying to Dr. Tarbox during the break, I always used, I was very fond of when we were doing our intensive behavioral intervention in the home of saying to the therapist, you guys set it up what the contingency is and then I will just do the follow through because it was hard for me as a parent. Right. So talk to us about this circumstance. I love that they've got the sticker chart. Absolutely. And we've had one success. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so, and you know, 
know, I would say the first thing, uh, first thing I would say is uh, what you mentioned is a great idea, which is if you do already have an ABA provider who's helping out with the toilet training, go to them first and basically say, what do you think we should do? Can you set this up for me? Yeah. And that's, that's the, always the first choice. However, if you are doing it yourself, this is something that parents can do by themselves, hopefully most of the time. Yes. You know, it's not easy, right? It's going right. to be a challenge. Um, but there's no reason why you can't give it a shot. Uh, it sounds like they already are, and they're, and they're doing good, right? It's at least a little bit of initial success. Um, so a couple of things here. The, the number one thing we always want to think about in ABA is set the kid up for success, right? Start yeah. small, set the kid up for success. And why do we want to do that? Because then it's easier for us to use positive reinforcement, right? And so they're already using positive reinforcement, right, mm -hmm. with, the, with the iPad for uh, waking up dry, which is fantastic. And so what we want to do is maximize the likelihood that they'll get to deliver that reinforcer because what happens when they deliver that reinforcer they cause behavior change and they make the kid happy right yeah. which is fantastic so uh, the point is how can we maximize the likelihood that the child is not gonna uh, that they are going to wake up dry okay so a couple things here uh, and these these would be antecedent modifications okay right? okay so uh, number one thing that I would recommend to start with is make sure that there's been sufficient time um, that elapses after the child has had their last beverage before they go to sleep. So if their bedtime is eight or nine o'clock, I would say no fluids after maybe six okay. or maybe even five, depending. You don't want to dehydrate the kid, obviously. Right. You know, use common sense, um, but focus on having plenty of fluids earlier in the day and cutting them off at least a few hours before bedtime. Okay. So that's going to make it easier for the child to be dry. Make sure, I know this is obvious, but make sure to do a potty, uh, potty trip right before bed every night without exception. Okay. Um, try that first. If that doesn't work, um, if they're still waking up wet the majority of the time, what you could try is, this is a little bit uh, extreme, but it might be worth it, is um, uh, try to identify when your child wets the bed at night and start actually waking them up in the middle of the night a little bit before that. Yeah. So if they usually end up going in their pants around three or four in the morning, you can go in there and wake them up at two in the morning and you know, nice and quietly and don't make a big deal out of it, but maybe bring them into the bathroom and have them go on the toilet get them back in bed and go back to sleep and uh, you might think that that's a horrible thing to do because you don't want to wake up at that time but waking up at 2:20 and taking your child to the bathroom and having them go is a lot easier than waking up at 3 30 and needing to change the sheets right or even honestly a lot easier than dealing with the disappointment and the frustration yes. of your child having woken up wet that you know even if you go in at six in the morning normal wake up time yeah. he's wet he's frustrated he doesn't get his ipad you're disappointed that yeah. it's not working. You know, you can avoid all of that by just losing a little bit of sleep. Yeah. And the thing is, is like everything else in ABA, if it works, you don't have to do it forever, right? right? So um, if that works to prevent being wet in the morning, then you, you do the iPad in the morning still, right? And so you reinforce having dry underwear in the morning, um, and then you should be able to fade out those nighttime wakings um, over time, maybe over the course of a few days or a week or two, you could even try fading the, the time slowly, closer and closer to the normal time. So if you start out with waking your child up at maybe 2 or 3 in the morning, then do that for a few nights, and when that works, then change it to 2.30, then maybe 3, then 3.30, like that, okay. and gradually fade it to where they're, they're staying longer and longer without uh, wetting, their, wetting their bed uh, until you don't have to do it anymore at all. Okay. Um, so it's not a permanent... Well, yeah, it is a permanent solution, but it's not something you have to do permanently, right? Okay. Um, so that's something to consider also. Great. Love that advice. Our next question, I'm just going to rapid fire them here because I want to get in as many sure. as we can. Uh, my son is 17 years old and he was late in diagnosis of autism. He's having major problems in social communications. Is there any center in Fresno, California who can help us? And all the programs that I looked at are focusing on younger children. I really need to know if there are any programs for this age group. Oh yeah, absolutely. We uh, we have a center in Fresno, uh, and we and our our Fresno clinic has been treating older kids and young adults for a long time, actually. So that's absolutely appropriate. And um, sure, some ABA providers specialize in early intervention or younger children, but the basic uh, principles and the basic techniques of what we do work equally well with a one-year-old, a ten-year-old, a twenty-year-old, and a fifty-year-old. Okay, it's just a matter of customizing them to make them appropriate, contextually appropriate, you know. Uh, so some of the techniques are going to have to be a little bit more, um, a little bit less structured, a little bit more conversation based, obviously, yeah. um, at, you know, to be appropriate for older uh, individuals. But absolutely, uh, the basic, I mean, the, to teach social understanding and conversation skills and uh, perspective taking skills and social communication mm -hmm. skills to adolescents and adults, it's the same basic strategies. You, you explain to them the, the rationale, you, you set up lots of scenarios and you 
do lots of practice with clear feedback. You can do things like video modeling, videotaping of oneself, and then reviewing the tape with feedback. But basically, it's a lot of practice. Make it fun as possible. Make it as easy as possible at first, and use lots of positive feedback when they do well. And absolutely, and I and I will take an opportunity to brag about how great Card is in this respect, and in particular Fresno, that has been at the forefront of this. So how lucky that you are there. Right. I really want to encourage you to contact the Card office. That's there. You can go to centerforautism.com, click on the locations tab, go to the Fresno office, mm -hmm. and or just call the main 1-800 number on the absolutely. website, and then they'll they'll connect them. Absolutely. Um, and so happy that you put where you're from so that we could get right to that. Okay, another uh, parent who wants to know, can you please su suggest some strategies for echolalia? My son is five and was at one time completely nonverbal. He now labels hundreds of things and sings Fantastic. songs, but was told today that they are hearing more echolalia in school. He really has no spontaneous speech yet, but he does do four to five word sentences. Okay, great. Well, first of all, that is a huge gain from yes. being, you know, more or less non-vocal to four or five word sentences is tremendous, yes. right? I mean, that's a huge deal. That yes. puts you in a whole different category of functioning level in terms of being able to determine your own, uh, your life and, and being able to control your life more. It's fantastic. Yes. It's really exciting. Um, so echolalia, yeah, you know, echolalia is one of those things that it really drives teachers nuts and it really drives parents nuts. Yeah. <laughs> um, and honestly, um, it's one of the last things that I like to focus on in terms of getting rid of it because it usually involves talking, right? And talking, or it always involves talking or vocalizing in some way. Mm -hmm. And that's usually something we're trying to increase as much as possible. Yes. Now, now, it's not to say that it can't be inappropriate and it can't be disruptive sometimes, right, in the classroom. Um, but the first thing I would say is let's pick our battles. Let's identify what skill is going to help my child or what set of skills is going to help my child function the best in each setting uh, and, and be able to to learn the best and socialize the most effectively in the school setting. And if echolalia really is impinging on the ability to learn while in school and to make friends and learn social skills while in school, then okay, let's, let's address it. If, if the reason why we're talking about it right now is because it's just kind of a little irritating or it's maybe it looks weird or something like that, mm -hmm. then we might want to reconsider, is it really a priority? Right. Um, so that's the first thing to think about. Okay. If it is a priority, right? Like, let's say we decide, yes, it's a priority. The tough news is it's one of the hardest behaviors to treat. Okay. <laughs> it's very challenging because usually it's automatically reinforced, which means it produces its own stimulation. It's fun, basically, to do. Mm -hmm. um, kids like to sort of relive, or it's a way of sort of reliving or remembering movies and mm -hmm. shows and stuff mm -hmm. like that that the kid loves. And let's face it, it's just kind of fun to do it sometimes yeah. for a lot of the kids that we work with, right? Um, and so it can be challenging. Um, so, you know, there's a whole long list of procedures that can work, you know, differential reinforcement of other behavior, mm -hmm. which is where you reward the child for not doing it. Mm -hmm. That can work. Um, awareness training, which is where you teach the child to observe their own behavior and identify when they're engaging in the behavior and sometimes even collect data on their own behavior. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, um, but the, the key is to focus on strategies that are based on positive reinforcement mm -hmm. um, and not punishment or, you know, right. reprimands, things like that. And, uh, you know, we, we didn't have so much a problem with echolalia, but we had some different things that were really hard like this. And, and one of the things that in, in the last, in the, you know, 11th hour was videotaping him and showing him mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. he did ended up being very effective. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, you want to keep it as positive as possible, right? right? You don't right. want it to be a punishment thing. But it, it can be when your child gets, and when, of course we don't know if this child is ready for this yet, but yeah, when your child five. does get to the, yes, so probably not, but yeah. um, when your child does kind of get to the sort of level of self-awareness where they kind of don't want to act weird, right. it, it's not a mean thing to do to say, all right, let's just watch some videotapes and let's right. kind of talk about some different ways of behaving. Make sure you include some good videotapes, yes. right? Make sure you include that's some really videotapes where your point. kid's being successful, right. being effective, and there's stuff you can talk about that's fantastic. Yes. Start with that, for goodness sake, right? And thank you for, for reminding, because that's so important. Self-esteem is such a huge thing, and we will always want to be instilling that. That's right. And by the way, that's not just for kids on the spectrum, right? That's yes. for all of us, right? Absolutely. We know that effective supervision of anybody, whether it's on the job or interacting effectively with your spouse, whatever it is, 
needs to be way more positive. What is it? Four times more positive than negative. Right? Yeah. So, Incredible. Very important. Okay. Uh, the next one, my son is on the spectrum and has some sensory issues, but I'm a little confused. He puts things like a rolled up napkin under his bottom when sitting down or a small ball, yeah. etc. I don't know if it, that he's seeking pressure from those things or it's a more of a serious issue he has going on with his rectum. I'm concerned that maybe he has some kind of infection going on. He's verbal and does let me know when something hurts, but has yet to tell me that his bottom hurts. Today I saw him trying to poke his bottom with a pencil. What do you think about this? Thanks a lot. Right. So, you know, a pretty intensive uh, behavior that yeah. I, w would certainly raise some concern. Yeah. Well, you know, anytime a parent expresses potential concern to me about uh, any potential medical problem, the first thing that you need to say is go to the doctor and yes. have it checked out, right? Yes. Um, while you're there, you probably have other stuff you're supposed to be doing at the doctor, too. Right. Or, you, know, it's probably, you can always make uh, use of the time. Yeah, exactly. Right? Um, and so definitely have it checked out. Why not, right? Mm -hmm. um, just to rule that out. Yeah. Um, so that would be the first thing. Uh, if it's not a medical problem, if it's just sort of a sensory thing, a mm -hmm. stereotypy thing, automatic reinforcement thing, um, I'm not really sure what to say about it. I mean, it doesn't sound like it's too much of a problem, the behavior in itself. It sounds mm -hmm. like she's more concerned about what that might indicate, right? right. Um, that behavior in itself, I really wouldn't mess with too much. I okay. mean, you know, another great general rule that we don't talk about enough in ABA right. is the importance of not intervening when you don't need to. Okay. Um, a lot, and again, this is not just for kids on the spectrum. This is for um, all of our kids. And again, all of our personal interactions is you, just because something happens that you don't like a whole lot doesn't mean you need to do something about it. A lot of times the very best thing you can do is not start an issue over something. So what might start out as a very minor automatically reinforced behavior or a very minor stereotypy, if you get in there and try to do something about it, you can turn it into a social interaction okay. between you and the kid. You can turn it into a power struggle. Right. You know, you can turn it into something that it really wasn't that and it wasn't a big deal if you just yeah. leave it alone. Okay. Um, I'm not saying do nothing and just let right. things become huge problems, but just you know, seriously consider, am I really supposed to start intervening right now or should I wait another week and just kind of see, you know, is this behavior actually interfering functionally with my child's ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, but, I, you know, starting with with the medical doctor, going sure. to the medical because Absolutely. there are a lot of things that could explain that. Right. Uh, you know, this that could be a hemorrhoid. Sure. Uh, that could be a fissure or something that the, what, where the pressure is feeling better. So, right. um, and, you know, I'm a big one for parent instinct. Mm -hmm. And it's always interesting to me because a parent will, will write something and they'll include a question in it that shows where you know where the instinct is yeah. and you're feeling like even you know I, I sort of feel like the argument that you're having with yourself is well you know he'll tell me if something hurts and he hasn't told me but my gut is telling me that there's something going on and so I would listen to that I would too um, Remember that our kids, like with their eyes and other things, they assume that if something's happening, that it's what happens to everyone. Mm -hmm. So if his butt is itchy, he might assume that's not a problem, that that's just what life is like, that right. you have an itchy butt. Right. <laughs> and that it feels better if you sit on something. Right. You know? Right. So he may not choose to tell you that. Okay, we've got some questions about uh, core curriculum. Okay. And this is an area that I, you know, I have not done enough uh, due diligence on core curriculum and what it means for our kids that are in special ed. And, I, and they want to know, Shannon, does your guest know anything about the extended core curriculum for special ed? Because uh, they go on to write, I want my son to go to college too, but I don't know if he'll be able to with this new extended core curriculum. I know that skills is now core curriculum aligned. Right, that's correct. Um, but I don't know about the extended core for special ed. Is I that an area either. that, okay. Not my area of so expertise. So here's what I want right. to promise to you though. It's an area that I'm interested in. And so we will get an expert who knows exactly what that is on in January because January because it is a, a subject that we're all going to want to know more information about and we know uh, you know there have been a lot of battles recently about what what we're going to consider mastered when we graduate people when we retain them is all a little bit in flux so I already had had it in my mind to have somebody on talking about that so we will do that I think we've got time for one more question and there's like 38 questions I want to uh, uh, but this is one that is a follow-up to one that we had talked about before last week about the person who was going to go to their IEP and ask right. for the FBA right. and ask for a BCBA. Right. And so their continuing question is, what should I expect from an, a BCBA as a parent on a school setting? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a, a great question. If we've mm -hmm. asked for the FBA mm -hmm. and we asked that a BCBA do that, mm -hmm. what...
what is our expectation as the parent that we're going to see happen in the ideal circumstance? Okay, great. So uh, basically, you know, it, each uh, board certified behavior analyst probably has, uh, you know, sort of their own ways of doing things, their own sort of clinical traditions, things like that, depending on who they're trained by, where they're mentored, things like that. But there are some basic core components that really should be in place. Um, things like duration might vary. You might be able to do a pretty good FBA in only six or eight hours. Mm -hmm. Some people might spend 12 or 18 hours, maybe even 20 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on the complexity of the case. It depends on uh, how successfully uh, and how efficiently each part of the process occurs. Um, so at the minimum, what you do is you start out by um, reviewing the, the child's records, so the chart review or record review. So you look at every FBA that's been done in the past. You read uh, all the information in the file about their, uh, where they live, you know, siblings, um, any medical conditions, things like that. Then you do an indirect assessment and an interview with uh, all relevant caregivers. So really what the BCBA should be doing is interviewing you, the parent, who knows your child the best, and asking you questions about when did the behavior start, under what circumstances does the behavior occur, and they basically collect as much information from you as they can about the behavior and mm -hmm. why it's happening. Then they go do the same thing with the teacher or whoever is most familiar with the behavior in the school setting, okay? Mm -hmm. And so they interview the teacher, the teacher assistants, whoever is familiar with the child and the behavior in the school setting, and they do a thorough interview and collect all the information they can. Uh, they analyze all of that information, and depending on the behavior analyst that's doing it, and the, depending on the school district that's doing it, they might think that that information is enough for the FBA uh, or for the functional assessment part. And so if they can come up with a reasonable hypothesis as to why the behavior is occurring in the school setting just by interviewing everybody and doing a record review, all of that is called the indirect assessment mm -hmm. portion of the FBA. Mm -hmm. uh, if they can come up with a reasonable hypothesis as to the function of the behavior, then they might be done with the functional assessment part. Now you write up a report and you describe, here's my hypothesis as to why the behavior is occurring, the function of the behavior. Here are some basic recommendations about what should be done. Um, they should also, at a minimum, go collect some baseline data. And what that means is go observe the child in the real environment where the behavior actually occurs and basically count how many times the behavior happens or measure the behavior in some way. So that gives you a baseline assessment of before treatment, how bad is this behavior? How often does it happen? In what settings does it happen? How severe is it? Okay. Um, you write all, write all of that up and come up with treatment recommendations. Okay, so that's the basic process. Um, more often than not, a good quality FBA should include one more component in the um, functional assessment process, okay. and that's called a descriptive or direct assessment, um, also known as ABC recording frequently. Okay, so that's where the, B the BCBA goes out, observes the child in the natural environment where they're really doing the behavior, and they record everything that happens. They take, collect data on everything that happens in the child's environment surrounding the challenging behavior. So let's say the behavior is a tantrum. Well, when the kid has a tantrum, what was happening five minutes for the five minutes prior to that? What are the antecedents to the behavior? Right. Was you know was the teacher asking him to do some work that he didn't want to do? Mm -hmm. Was the teacher removing something from him that he wanted to play with? Was the teacher um, uh, not paying enough attention to him mm -hmm. and he's kind of sitting there by himself for a while? Mm -hmm. uh, then you record what happened with the behavior and then you record everything that happened immediately after the behavior, right. the consequence part, right? right? So did he get attention? Did he get a break from work? Did he get to have the thing, the toy that he wanted that he didn't want to share? Uh, or what other consequences happened? After after the behavior. You do that for a while, and research hasn't told us how long a while needs to be, okay? <laughs> Best case scenario, maybe two or three hours. Okay. Uh, oftentimes it could be six, eight hours across multiple days, who knows? But you collect data until you see a clear pattern of results that in general, the behavior frequently occurs in a particular type of context right. that's, that uh, would indicate one particular type of function. So for example, for the escape function, in general, the behavior usually occurs when someone asks the child to do a non-preferred task, okay? okay. And in general, the reaction from caregivers or teachers or whoever it is, in general, is usually to help the child with the task mm. or to give them a break from the task right. or to let them calm down for a while before doing the task or to um, negotiate how much of the task they have to do. All of those consequences are giving the child some form of escape right. or avoidance of the task that he doesn't want to in do. In other words, it's working. Right, he, behavior's he working. He engages in that behavior and he gets out of it for even 10 seconds, right. but it's working. Right, absolutely. Okay. And so thank you for bringing it back to the real nuts and bolts level. The purpose of the FBA is to figure out how the behavior is working. Right. It's not to figure out whether it's working. We know it's working. Right. right? Or the they kid wouldn't, wouldn't keep be doing, doing the behavior if it wasn't working. Okay? That's the big first mental shift that right. you have to realize is there is a paycheck or they right. wouldn't they keep wouldn't doing it. They wouldn't be doing it. And so the purpose of the FBA is to figure out how it's working. 
working okay. and in what way is it working describe right. all of that and describe how we can make a more adaptive behavior a better right. replacement behavior work instead right it's not just about wishing it to go away right it's putting something else in its place and teaching other skills that's right and making sure that you set them up for success and you follow through on it right and you know we got to give give the kids some credit he figured out a way to get what he wants yeah. it's not an appropriate way and it's not good for him or the classroom but he figured out how to get what but he it needs. is functioning for him right or he wouldn't keep doing it right. okay important so you can expect all of these things to happen from the BCB and if, if they're doing their if job. If they're doing their job. Yeah. And you you should expect, in my estimation, and I'm sure that different school districts will feel different ways, but remember, you are always on your child's team. Right. Anybody who tries to tell you otherwise does not know what they're talking about. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> right? And... Um, I'm always reminding, you know, when, and I will say things like, I'm sorry, when did I get voted off the team? Uh, when I get my sarcasm on. But um, you're on the team, so you get to be there when they, you know, will tell the IEP team, here's the function of the behavior, right. and when they're planning the BIP. You get Absolutely. to be there Absolutely. if you choose to be. And, and I want to encourage you to be there. Uh, otherwise, things can get derailed. That's right. Uh, but great, great suggestion. Now, we've had several different questions about language, about teaching language, but in particular, and I can't find it in my list, but I know it's in there, about a child who's been learning a bunch of labels. Okay. And how do we get that, how do we work from labeling to get to conversation? Right adding words right 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 to okay. you know so if the child you they point and they say dog uh how do we get more words out of them right that's great it's a great yeah. question and and really honestly the answer is not a quick snippet it's oh it's no because we the, only have like a minute it's one of the most interesting and complex parts of, a, of okay. aba therapy right so Anyone can train a kid to memorize a bunch of labels, right. okay? You don't even really need to be a good ABA therapist to train a kid to memorize a bunch of labels, okay? okay? But that is not language. That's not meaningful use of language. It's certainly not communication by any sense of the term, okay? So what really matters is the child being able to actually use those labels in the course of their everyday interaction in life, okay? And then, of course, becoming more complex would be nice. But the first step is even just, um, rather than when I hold this up and say, what is it, Pen? good job, right? right? Rather than that, when you're hanging out in the natural environment with your kid, they notice a pen and they say, look, mom, it's a pen, right? right. Or maybe they just point at it and say, pen. Right. Um, or maybe, um, when a pen is out of reach and they need a pen to draw the picture that they want to draw, they point up to it and say pen, right? right. And then you give them the pen, right? right? All of these are examples of how pen is actually, the label pen is actually used in your regular life as opposed yeah. to when you're just being quizzed on it, right? And um, so if we're, if we're using technical terms, those are the verbal operants, right? Right, exactly right. So asking for a pen when you want it is a man. Um, pointing out something when you see it just randomly, not when you're asked, is attacked. Right. Okay? Uh, and those are natural use of language in your yeah. real life as a opposed to just kind of being drilled, okay? okay? So that's the first thing, is you need to focus on establishing that. It sounds like perhaps maybe their child is already there and now we're interested in expanding, right? Yeah. So the way to expand it is to simply um, work on that, but work on adding things to it. Right. And, and one of the best um, pieces of advice that I've been given is add things that actually matter. So okay. add words that add functionality for the okay. kid, okay? Okay. So um, it's a pen. Oh, we're out of time. Hurry, out of time. it's okay. a pen. It's a pen, not so functional. More pen or big pen or okay. black pen or something like that are ways that the kid can actually specify what they actually want. Okay. Rather than say, like, I want pen, not so helpful if they can already say pen and they get it, right? Okay. We're out of time, but thank you so much for being here. Happy New Year to everybody. Happy holidays. We'll be back on January 8th. We've got an incredible show then. Thank you to Dr. Jonathan Tarbox, and thank you to all you. Happy holidays. Give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now.